Hello, my name is Robert Singer. I am a professor at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and also a senior fellow at the Genilio Research Campus of the Howard Hughes. And what I want to talk to you about is the developments that led up to our ability to actually image gene expression within single cells. And that's illustrated here in this cover slide where individual RNAs are, can be seen in the nucleus of cells and in the cytoplasm. And this uh, technology has taken uh, a long time to develop, so I want to talk a little bit about the history of this technology. So, what I would like to tell you is, in this lecture, is how we use the technique of in situ hybridization to detect single molecules in uh, cells, in individual cells, why that's important, why is it important to look at single cells, and why is it important to look at the RNA in single cells. And then I'm going to do a little history of the development of in situ hybridization from the pioneer days of using radioactivity to the modern era where we use fluorescence and this technique called fluorescence in situ hybridization, how it has evolved now into further technology which allows us to look at thousands of RNAs in cells. And then finally, what we can find out using this technique is that RNA localizes in cells and its translation is also likewise localized and that's how proteins get to the right place. Just to refresh your memory, what is the central dogma that uh, allows us to look at these things in real in, uh, individual cells? First, we have transcription, and the polymerase, the transcription is where the polymerase makes the RNA from the gene. The RNA then travels from the gene out to the cytoplasm, where it then uh, makes the proteins. In, uh, in particular regions of the cell. And we're going to see those events occur in cells by looking at these individual molecules. So how do we study messenger RNA? Uh, we study messenger RNA uh, generally by a bulk analysis. Well, so what does that mean? It means that we take a bunch of cells and we grind them up and then we look to see what RNAs are present. We can use either this, a northern blot, or we can use a microarray. A northern blot is where the RNAs are separated according to their size by electrophoresis and then probed with a probe of a particular sequence to see if the RNA uh, is there and what size it is. The microarray has a lot of uh, DNA sequences uh, splayed out on a grid like this and the RNA uh, that's labeled now hybridizes to a particular spot. And by using a lookup table, you can see where the RNA is hybridized and what sequence that is, uh, what genetic sequence that corresponds to. Or we can just sequence the RNA from a bunch of cells and see what RNAs are present in the total sample. But these techniques miss an important point. What is the spatial and temporal variation that you can see when you look at single cells? And this was evident to me when I was a postdoc because I worked on this system, which is a differentiation of muscle and culture. And in this um, example, you can see that some cells have differentiated into muscle and they form um, this uh, syncytium, which is known as a myotube, and uh, other cells are in the process of actually going to fuse into this, and some cells are just uh, sitting out there not doing anything, um, for example, up here. So, so if you grind up the sample, uh, you get everything that's being made in all these cells, but you don't know which cells are making which RNAs, and that's important because there's a switch that occurs here from making cellular uh, proteins to making muscle proteins. That's further exemplified by some work uh, that was done on bacteria in which the bacterial gene here 
is, um, is um, two genes are being expressed by the two identical genes are expressing uh, the same uh, RNA, except for one makes a red protein and one makes a green protein. And you can see in the, in the cells here, some are yellow, but some are green and some are red, indicating that uh, there's a uh, stochastic variation in what uh, genes are being expressed, even though the cells all have the same genotype. And that's true in mammalian cells as well. One can show the same sort of variation in identical cells that are making now different proteins, but from the same uh, two genes. And this becomes important in, uh, in health-related issues, because sometimes the rare event cell is the one that causes us all the tr trouble. For instance, if that cell develops a chemoresistance uh, during therapy, that cell, single cell, can expand uh, by clonal expansion into a tumor, which is now totally chemoresistant. So, to be able to follow those single cells are what we want to be able to develop the technology for. Aside from looking at individual cells, single cell analysis provides an additional type of information that's very important, and that's spatial information within the cell. So, we know that cells are highly compartmentalized because they have different proteins in different parts of the cell, membrane proteins, nuclear proteins, proteins in mitochondria. And this compartmentalization results from the protein being sorted to the right place. But there isn't enough spatial information encoded in the protein to get it to the right place in the cell. Therefore, spatial information for protein compartmentalization has to come from localized RNA, and that localized RNA uh, makes the protein in the right place. Hence, RNA itself must contain spatial information. And the question is, how do we access and define where that spatial information is? Well, initially, the approach that we used was to use a radioactive probe and to fix the cells and put these radioactive probes, or they're labeled with tritium, on the cell and uh, let them hybridize to their targets. But in order to detect the probes, we had to use a photographic emulsion. And the photographic emulsion then uh, illustrates where the uh, decay particle has hit, and it generates a silver grain, much as if it were a photon of light. And those silver grains build up over a period of time. Unfortunately, this time takes three months, because isotopic uh, decay occurs very slowly. Um, tritium decays once every 12 years or something like that. So, so you have to have a lot of molecules and a lot of decay to generate enough grains. But eventually, you can see this sort of result, which is the first example that showed localization of an mRNA, in this case, beta-actin mRNA. And you can see that the RNA is localized non-homogeneously in the cell. In fact, it's localized to the tips of cells, or in this case down here, uh, to the leading edge of the cell, where the uh, beta-actin protein is used for cell motility. I'll mention more about that later. So, uh, one can get this kind of information not uh, as terrific resolution as one could get with fluorescence. So, we thought about um, this problem of radioactive decay, because not only does it take a long time, but the, the decay causes spreading of a signal onto the emulsion. And uh, you don't know exactly where the point source was that led to the grain, which is five microns away in the, in the photographic emulsion. So, we worked on developing a fluorescent method for uh, localizing the RNA probe that hybridized to the RNA target of interest. 
So originally, we went through a series of uh, probe development. Uh, first, you can use a double-stranded DNA plasmid um, or bacterial artificial chromosomes or RNA probes. Uh, and all of these are labeled by enzymatic methods, which um, copy the double-stranded DNA. And all of them cause problems because uh, the double-stranded DNA self-hybridizes and causes spurious signals. So that wasn't a very good approach. Uh, and it was only until the 90s that we developed single synthetic oligonucleotides that were coupled to fluorochromes that could be used as probes. So the first uh, fish images that we got uh, were very clear that, um, that fluorescence gives you high resolution. So this is a single gene. It's actually an integrated virus in a human chromosome 1. And you can see the two genes, the alleles of the genes, uh, exactly displayed with these two bright spots on the uh, metaphase spread. So this was our indication that the fluorescence in cyto hybridization was going to be a very accurate and precise technique. So uh, just to summarize how this is now done, we take uh, a DNA, uh, single-stranded DNA probe with fluorescent dyes coupled to it, we put it on the cell, and it finds its way to its target RNA, whatever the sequence is. And the fluorescence uh, would tell you where the uh, RNA is in the cell. So the extension of this technology was to actually see single RNAs. And in order to do this, we had to put a number of fluorochromes on the uh, probe. And we had to make a number of probes. So when you multimerize them on, the, on an RNA, and you can make many of these 50 nucleotide probes, or now 20 nucleotide probes are used, you can put many of them on the RNA. They carry many fluorochromes to the target RNA, and it allows you to see the uh, individual RNAs. So this was the first example of that. Uh, this was... this is uh, in a nucleus, so this... this uh, uh, blue uh, structure here is a nuclear envelope, and here are individual RNAs in the nucleus, presumably making their way out to the cytoplasm. And there is uh, actually a bright focus here that uh, is... Uh, contains structure as well as brightness. And that is the place where RNA is being born. So that's what we call a transcription site. And the reason it's so bright is because of the fact that the polymerases that are lined up on the gene making the nascent RNA chain uh, have... Are, are closely compacted on the, D, on the gene, and therefore there's many RNA targets at that site. The most intense concentration of RNA you can find in the cell is actually the site of where RNA is being born, because that's a fountain of RNA that's, uh, that's being produced there. So these are the first uh, examples of, uh, of the uh, RNAs. The... Um, with the single RNA technology. Now, here in the far left, you can see two RNAs uh, being made at two different genes. One is a beta-actin gene, and the other is a gamma-actin gene. And you can see both alleles um, are labeled with their individual colors. So one is red and one is green, and allows you to distinguish two RNAs being made in the same cell. And in fact, um, you can see in the cytoplasm the individual RNAs. And you could say, well, here's a, a gamma-actin RNA, here's a beta-actin RNA, and so forth, when you label them separately. Now, when you label them on the same RNA... Okay, so now we're putting uh, the red and the, um, and the green together on one RNA. You can see both those colors co-localized, because they're attached to the same molecule. And you can even see here... Um, on this RNA 
over here, the green part is the 5 prime end of the RNA, the red part is the 3 prime. So you can even see the orientation of the RNA is pointing down and to the right. And in fact, you could put on a now a third color, a blue color, and the blue color is uh, here uh, at the very 3 prime end of the RNA, so in the untranslated region. And you can and it's only 300 nucleotides away from the green. And you can see the green and the blue actually co-localize and give you white. But the red still sticks out because it's a kilobase away. And so you're resolving, essentially, here, one kilobase uh, distance of RNA. And using these three colors, you can then determine from the uh, transcription sites over here on the far left how many greens, how many reds, and how many blues there are. And by dividing the fluorescence of a single molecule into the total fluorescence of the transcription site, you can build a picture of how many uh, polymerases are on this gene and where those polymerases are. So the results show that, for instance, down here, the, um, there are many uh, polymerases that, um, that start out um, at the 5 prime end, and then um, they pick up signal, uh, red signal, and then blue signal as they go through the end. And you can see that the signal compresses here at the end, indicating that termination of the transcript is a rate-limiting step in um, making uh, the RNA, um, the mature RNA that goes into the cytoplasm. So you get a lot of information from this kind of analysis, single molecule, single cell analysis. Now, of course, I showed you two colors, but one could add many, many colors, and one can mix the colors so that some RNAs are blue and green, and some are blue and red, and some are green and red, and so forth. And uh, using um, five different fluorochromes, one can get as many as uh, 12 RNAs labeled in the cell. And so, in this work, we were able to show that you could look at 12 RNAs at once. Uh, here are the genes that we looked at. And, um, and this is an example of a nucleus over here where uh, the different RNAs are... the different gene expressions are, are, ex are uh, described in the nucleus. And uh, you can use an algorithm. In fact, an algorithm was designed that essentially looks at each transcription site and tells you which gene it is. So there are 11 genes here, and um, they are all described um, and expressed in the, in, in the cells in different combinations, indicating that some genes are on in some cells, some genes are off in some cells. And that led to our understanding that genes actually pulse. So now, uh, what's been the development since then? There's been a lot of really excellent work by a number of labs at Harvard, Caltech, and other places, which can um, actually sequence now the RNA from uh, individual cells by dissociating them, say, from brain tissue, and then uh, looking at the uh, expression of those genes um, in various uh, cell types and, and characterizing cell types according to their transcriptome, the, the RNAs that they transcribe. And then you can take that and go back now to the tissue with sequences that you're interested in. So here's an example of the, tish, the way the tissue is probed with these different genes to see which morphologies gave rise to which uh, transcripts. And that gives you a spatial cell type distribution based on what's being transcribed, not only the morphology. So there are now ways to amplify the genes so that they're very, very bright, so that you can use them in tissues easily, because tissues have a lot of autofluorescence, and it's hard to get single molecule analysis done in the background of autofluorescence, but by amplifying the genes with these types of procedures, uh, for instance, um, this, this hybridization chain reaction 
where you, you put sequences on your probes uh, here, and uh, those sequences that are added to the probe now serve as a substrate to build a hybridization chain reaction onto them, making many, many fluorochromes available for an individual RNA. Or a variation of this called RNA scope allows you to um, use two probes together that when they hybridize together in the same RNA, they uh, allow you to generate an, uh, this hybridization tree, which now amplifies the signal. And this is very effective because it reduces background because you're requiring two events to occur on an RNA instead of just one. And then how do you multiplex many, many hundreds, for instance, of RNAs? Well, it so happens that the cells are very, uh, very resistant. The fixed cells are very resistant to uh, disintegration, so they maintain their RNA in, in the right places in the cell. And so you can uh, hybridize RNAs in different rounds, strip them off, put the next round on, and strip that off and so forth. And you can do this as many as 16 times to build up a picture of, uh, of uh, the uh, number of genes that are being expressed in an individual cell. And so this brings together single cell analysis and sequencing so that uh, you can relate the transcriptome of a cell to its... Uh, to its uh, uh, gene expression pattern and to its morphology or to its spatial distribution in tissues. Now, one of the things that Fish revealed for us is that mRNAs are spatially regulated, and what's the mechanism for this? So, there are now many, many examples of localized mRNAs. I think most mRNAs are localized somewhere in the cell. They're not accidentally floating around randomly. And there are really uh, a, a number of examples in development, such as in uh, Drosophila embryos or in uh, Xenopus oocytes. And uh, in, even in yeast, uh, RNA is localized in the, in the yeast to the bud tip. And in the fibroblasts, RNA is localized to the leading edge. Uh, Beta-actin RNA is localized to the leading edge. So, I'll briefly go into those. and and end up with a mechanism which allows this to happen. So, we proposed many years ago that there was something called a zip code on RNA. And the zip code converts... allows um, spatial information to be encoded in the RNA. And that spatial information has to be transduced from the RNA sequence into cellular spatial information. So, how does that happen? We propose that there is some ribonucleoprotein that binds the RNA, possibly in the 3' UTR of the RNA, so it doesn't interfere with the translation of the RNA. And that uh, ribonucleoprotein now cu is coupled to something in the cell which allows that RNA to be sorted. So the example, the first example we showed is this, uh, is this actin beta actin mRNA localization. So here we have uh, now a fluorescent version of that uh, isotopic uh, cells that I showed you from the, from the cover. Uh, but now the RNA is red, fluorescently red, beta actin, and the beta actin protein is now fluorescently green. And you can see that the RNA is at the leading edge of the cell where the protein is... Uh, necessary for cell motility. And so, the localization of the RNA, we propose, drives the motility of this fibroblast forward, because actin uh, protein is constantly polymerizing at the leading edge of the cell, driving the cell membrane forward. So, if you chop up this beta-actin RNA into little pieces and you make a reporter and then you see where each piece... which each piece contains the information to carry the RNA to the right place. You come down 
to this place in the 3' UTR uh, that we call the zip code. And you can, using this zip code as a means of isolating a protein by affinity uh, columns, you can isolate a protein that we uh, sequenced and called ZBP1, zip code binding protein. This protein has this kind of a conformation. It's a, an RNA binding protein, a canonical RNA binding protein, um, and the RNA binds to the C-terminal uh, domains known as KH domains, K homology domains, that are important for RNA binding. Importantly, if you knock out ZBP in a mouse, the mouse dies. So it's an essential protein. So what does ZBP1 do? Well, it, um, it blocks the localization, it blocks the um, translation of the protein until it gets localized. And this makes a lot of sense, because if you're going to localize um, a, a messenger RNA, you don't want it to translate it until it gets to the place where it's supposed to make the proteins. So ZBP1 goes on to the RNA uh, as it's being made in the nucleus, and it comes out with the, nu with the RNA in the nucleus. And it doesn't allow the RNA to be translated because it blocks ribosomes from getting on the RNA. So the ribosome uh, uh, 60S subunit that needs to join with a smaller subunit to make a ribosome that can translate, the ZBP1 blocks that step. Okay, so then how does it get off and allow the RNA to translate? Well, at the end of the line, in this case, at the periphery of the cell, but it could be the growth cone of neurons, it could be uh, the spine of dendrites, um, it will then be phosphorylated on a tyrosine residue, and that phosphorylation will cause ZBP1 to let go of the RNA, and the RNA at that point can be translated. So the RNA is locked up in a untranslatable form, and it will be uh, then released from this untranslatable form when it gets to the right place and gets uh, modified. Now, just to illustrate this, here is an impaired ZBP1 that can't bind the RNA. And you see a movie here of this cell in the middle that's, um, that's expressing the modified ZBP1 that can't bind RNA. And you see that cell, it goes this way, it goes that way, uh, but it has no direction to it. And, and uh, you can see the other cells, the other fibroblasts, moving across the screen to the top, and they are um, going, making great distances. Uh, you can compare their perimeter plots here, uh, and you can see that the cell that's got the impaired CBP1 just never gets anywhere. And that illustrates what the localization of the, uh, and localized translation of the RNA does. It creates a polarity for the cell, and that polarity allows the cell to undergo long-range motility, which is important for fibroblasts because they have to sense a gradient. If you get a cut in your skin, they have to go to the site where the cut is, and they have to sense a gradient of uh, platelet-derived growth factor and get there to repair the wound. So fibroblasts have to go long distances um, in the body to repair a wound. Now, another uh, protein uh, that, I, that is uh, another example of RNA localization is this ASH1 protein. So ASH1 is a protein which has been shown to prevent mating type switching in yeast, uh, in the daughter cell. And uh, so in order for the daughter cell and the mother cell to mate in the next generation and form a diploid cell, one of those has to change its genotype. And so how do you change a genotype from one cell to uh, uh, two daughter cells with different genotypes? And that's really the basis of how we think about differentiation and development from a single oocyte. 
So what happens is Ash1 protein blocks the switching of the gene so that the daughter cell has the same genotype as the mother, and the mother switches its genotype. So how does that happen? How does this occur within the same cytoplasm? And so we found the answer uh, was very clear, that it's the messenger RNA for this protein that goes into the daughter cell. And uh, it makes protein here, only in the daughter cell, which then goes into the nearby daughter nucleus, which is right here. So here's the nucleus, here's the protein, and there's the RNA over there on the far left. And uh, the protein that's gone into the daughter nucleus now affects a change in the genotype by preventing an endonuclease from... Uh, from modifying the Ash1 gene. I mean, from modifying the uh, mating type switching. So, uh, we know that these zip codes are stem loops. Here you see a perfect example you, of uh, the localized Ash1 message. In the, in the yeast to the left, you see the, it's only in the daughter uh, cell. But if you do one mutation in the in the zip code, in the stem loop, um, you can see here that the RNA now has no idea where it's supposed to go. And so it... Uh, and so it now is everywhere. And so these cells are unable to undergo mating type switching and therefore unable to go through sexual reproduction in the next cycle to make a diploid cell. And diploids are important, as you know, in biology. Now, how does it get there? It gets there by assembling a complex, which includes a motor. So the motor is myosin, and the myosin uh, now uh, collaborates with these RNA binding proteins and a junction protein, and they all form this four-wheel drive vehicle on the four zip codes of the Ash1 message. And when that collides with the cytoskeleton, uh, the actin, filaments, which are only pointed in one direction, they only go toward the bud. The myosin is... can only go in one direction on actin, toward the barbed end, and therefore the RNA, as soon as it gets on the actin, is destined to end up at the bud tip. It has no choice. And in the next talk, I'm going to show you um, developments which allowed to look at... allowed us to look at this in live cells um, in real time. So, just to end up with some of the general principles of localized translation, we have... Um, uh, just to reiterate that whether it's in yeast or in mammalian cells, we have proteins that block translation. And I'll get into that a little bit more in the, uh, in the talk about the neurons. They block the translation of the RNA uh, so that the RNA can then move unimpeded by ribosomes to its endpoint. And the endpoint, uh, it then is acted on by various enzymes that phosphorylate and in, in yeast, casein kinase, uh, and in mammalian cell SARC, and then that releases the RNA to translate. And that's how the translation occurs at the end of the line. So these are the... Uh, the uh, people that fund the work that need to get some credit. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, we'll go in the next talk into looking at these processes occurring in real time. Thank you.